dinner. Got it. There we go. So hopefully, yes, I've um, been flying gliders for about 18 years. I didn't actually do much. Any, I mainly did power flying in the UK and then came to Australia and I decided to do gliding because um, I always saw the power boys or the gliding people at the AFL used to flew to have a lot more fun than the uh, power flying people. Um, so this lesson is about flight preparation. <laughs> There's a mixture of experiences here. So do chip in with your own stories because that really helps um, us all learn. I, I still learn um, something every, every time we're at the airfield. And... Yes, I, I liked. I would have liked to have done outlanding lecture because I'm good at those. <laughs> Maybe if I prepared more, I would do fewer. Um, but anyway, there we are. So flight preparation. Let's just run through um, the, the main the main topics here. So it's really it's really important. It, if a well prepared flight is one you're much likely more likely to actually challenge yourself in those early solo days <laughs> i was quite nervous about doing cross country and um if if you are well prepared you tend to to think no let's go for it and if you're not well prepared you you find a mental reason why uh, maybe it's not right and you end up just local soaring so i i went through that phase of um you know, sometimes not being ready to push on. So, but it's all about prep. Um, personal preparation, we'll go through that. Glider preparation, retrieve preparation and checklists. So, yeah, why do we prepare? Um, start, starts well before the flight. So, look, I'm going to flick between different... Um, different slides here because we've got the gfa slides and then i've just got some of my own which i might just um bring up so to me it starts weeks before even months before um but but certainly it's certainly um um two or three days before which is kind of the weather window on sky site isn't it um where it starts to get pretty solid as to what's going on. Um, so, so, so always think about that. Um, reduces stress and improves performance. It, it definitely reduces stress. Um, and yeah, you've got a, a chance to improve your performance. It, it, reduces, it reduces risk um, and makes flying more fun. Um, well, if we get into it, we'll we'll talk about risks and risk management. The personal prep is probably the easiest bit. Um, um, hydration, nutrition, relief, sunglasses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we all know about those, and they they can be um, put together on the morning of the flight, can't they? It doesn't take much to whip around the cupboards and grab all those things um well rested that's important so i'm i'm not a fan of towing a glider say to raywood or to horsham or something and and sort of de-rigging it that back us rigging it at, at horsham having driven all day and then thinking about going cross country i will the most i would do is is I might tow the you know one I normally try and de-rig it not the same day as I rig it so if you can de-rig it a few days before if you're going to take it somewhere but um when you get to the place that you're uh I, I would do a test flight I'd rig the glider and do a quick local soaring flight but I wouldn't drive all the way somewhere rig the glider and then go and do a 300k because you end up not well rested and you actually end up stressed and rushing and everything else and all those factors that that make it go wrong so do think about that because it can look tempting oh i'll just de-rig the i'll take it up there the weather's good i'll rig it then i'll jump in and i'll fly it well things go wrong and time gets away and you'd be much better off not 
planning across country the same day you're towing somewhere. Um, that helps with the well rested bit. Um, well rest as well. Parties and things the night before are not good, so I wouldn't be be um, out on the town if I was thinking of doing cross country the next day. Um, another aspect of being well rested. Flight planning we'll talk about a bit later. Later in the weather forecast. So the weather forecast is a subject of another lecture, but but the weather forecast normally is what causes us to plan, isn't it? Because you start looking at we, we well we work we live in different worlds but you've got days off that are quite often fixed but i'm looking at the weather and if i can get you know a glider available the weather available um and it's a day where i can be there getting those three to align is what i'm always looking for so you do want to be looking you know two or three days out for cross-country flight do think about relief you know that's you need the p-tube or you need uh um some kind of um is onboard bottles and things like that that you can have um but it is important to be able to go to the toilet in flight if you're planning a long flight and that's something again you need to plan that weeks or months out you, it's no good trying to fix all that up on the day You've got to plan it, you've got to bought the stuff and you have to have it. So that one's a bit long, you know, in planning terms, relief is a longer one. Nutrition, look, I, I, I don't think you need excessive food on a flight. I mean, I just, if I'm doing a long cross country, I might just take an apple to eat. I mean, we all go from one o'clock till six and seven o'clock between lunch and dinner without eating anything. And you don't, don't need a massive amount of food but i take an apple people take different things um i i take if in case i outland i might take some sugary things in case it's going to be a long kind of wait or long walk or something some sugary sweets to chew on for a sort of outlanding food so think about nutrition but it's more about being eating your lunch before the flight than thinking you've got to pack a massive amount of food and try and eat it on the flight. Yeah, Paul, just uh, with um, relief, if if you don't have a P-tube in your glider, um, the, the best device I've seen for men um, is the bladder from a wine cask. You know, you've you got to work hard to fill four litres. Um, and yeah. the, you've got a really good seal and also a nice big hole. Uh, so, uh, if you, uh, if you know someone that, uh, drinks the, the shadow cardboard, hit them up for the, uh, for the used bladder. Oh, that's a good tip. Um, thanks for that. Uh, and the other thing is you can wash them out and use them in subsequent days. We fill them with wine later, Dave. Um. Yes. So yeah, glider prep. So um clean airframe, clean canopy, comfortable parachute instruments, especially Vario and flight computer and batteries. So again, if if you're going cross country, those first three, cleaning the airframe, the canopy, um being comfortable and have a parachute well presumably it's not the first time in a glider and you've got got club shoots or your own shoot etc but again you don't want to be the best way to plan a cross-country flight if, if it's a typical one with uh, you know either you're going to do a self-briefing around 10 11 or um, you're at a coaching week or comp or something and there's a briefing that's at sort of at 10 and 11 it's best to have all this done early in the morning so get the airfield early um and get it and get that sort of thing done um batteries you have have spare batteries <laughs> the, the number of times i've had battery problems it's you just you just don't want to be trying to fiddle with wires and get things working because you think it is charged it's just it's not working switch to another battery i definitely have a so be 
get your battery in early and make sure it's working um and and have options for spare batteries so i wouldn't you know go on a camp without having a spare battery for my glider as well as spare batteries for anything else um because it, it's all about you know most of us are time poor and it's and you don't want to miss a good day because your battery is us and the other thing is it's very often the number of flights i've done where the battery goes flat halfway around particularly in club gliders um it, it's 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 common so you know again preferably make sure you pick a good battery if it's a club battery and make sure it was on charge for the whole week before or the whole few days before um because i mean it it doesn't it's not critical it's 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 higher risk flying with no battery because you've got no radio you've got no electric vario got no flam so you've just upped your your mid-air collision risk by letting the battery go flat um we certainly learned in our club where we when was it 2017 we had someone hit a winch wire and 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 you know coming into coming into approach and and fundamentally while all the bits of swiss cheese lined up the first bit of swiss cheese was the battery went flat and he hadn't done a long flight probably only an hour or two hours um and so he didn't couldn't make radio calls and then everything all the other bits of swiss cheese lined up and he's very lucky but he's still here um and that person so batteries pretty important out of all of those let me just flick to some, see if my picture thing's working so i can flick between uh some of the, my other pictures here yeah, so this, the, you know, just example, um, you know, just pick some some of my own. Uh, let's make that full screen. So I was doing a cross country flight in the LSA. Sorry, I... Paul, you haven't changed the view. Oh, hang on. Okay. Do, do, do. So if you stop sharing and then reshare. Re reshare. Yeah, okay. Stop share. That's what we'll have to do. Share screen. So, yeah, look, I just to give an example, I'm sure you all do it, but I hadn't flown to LS for a while and it was a good day coming up and I've been busy, but because I hadn't flown it for a while, I knew there'd be potential problems. So I actually just went to back of Smarsh one evening and you can see got it out in the day, dying moments and put batteries in it, checked everything was working, wash, gave it, gave it a good wash so that i got a whole heap of stuff out the way because i knew that you know the next day uh you know i didn't want to find problems in the morning at harper state so i'm still stuffing around with problems at um harper 12 um, and, and not being relaxed and being basically stressed for my flight so uh let me just try this tab thing did that go back to the gpc no. lecture no, okay, I have to do the stop share then. All right, stop share. Well, I'm sure there's a more elegant way, but... Wait, we'll, we'll do it. That's all right. I don't know. We can do it this way. Uh, where's my zoom again? Start share. I'll try and minimise my... Are there any questions on on checking the airframe? I don't know if anyone else, but I'd say all my problems are always electronics when it comes to prepping the glider. Um, trailer and car. Look, I think we've all done cross countries where you didn't really have a retrieve crew, and it, it does up the stress level. Because, you know, if you do outland, you'll be begging someone, you know, that's not really prepared um, 
to uh, come and get you. So definitely now, uh, two things I do: you, you need to have a you need to be prepared to outland. I, I rarely do cross countries on a Sunday because I've always got a busy day Monday, and I can't afford you know an outlanding retrieve can go badly wrong and you end up having to spend the night somewhere so you have to you have to plan like that this is part of pre-flight prep of saying what if i do outland um and it's generally going to be late and i don't get i won't get back to the airfield till 11 o'clock at night um you know can i afford can i afford that time if you can't then don't go cross country it's the wrong day for you but have a retrieve crew um planned and i don't know how many people have done retrieves here but it's always better <laughs> with two of you in a retrieve crew so if possible have two people it's just when you're wandering around at night trying to find some gps location with a you know a, it, 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 it the last few but the last 10 Ks in trying to find the glider can be difficult. And if you've got someone that can read the map and look while you're driving, um, it, it's a bit easier. And then three people, if it's a single, three people de-rigging is just easier as well. So if at all possible, encourage I'd encourage you to have two people plan to come and get you. And on the other foot, if, you know, we all need retrieve crews occasionally, if you know if 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 someone's got you as a retrieve crew i would go and find a friend and say will you come with me it's just so much easier with two um road legal so like obviously the, the trailer has to be road legal so it must be registered must be serviceable um people the tradition is that you take the person's car that's being um that's doing the retrieve i personally just use my own car you, you know insurance can be so dodgy these days with small print that you just think i'll just drive my own car and pick the person up rather than use their car but if you are going to use their car make sure they've got it correctly insured you know there's all sorts of exclusions as you know in car insurance and if they've had an accident and if they've had this and then you know so while it might say any driver um they often aren't any driver in the small print so um you pr i'd say <laughs> preferably use your own car um electrics are compatible yes check the trailer lights again you need to do this you need to have done this before the day of flight because again if you find a problem messing with trailer lights suddenly from from harper state till till one you're rushing off to super cheap trying to buy things trying to get the trailer working and generally getting stressed um while everyone else is pushing gliders on the flight line sitting in the clubhouse looking at weather and planning you're, you're trying to fix a trailer so and trailer lights, as we know, are notoriously fickle. Useful to have. Uh, definitely, you want to be trying it with the car before um, before the day. Um, make sure that the trailer has got everything in it. That's. You might you might say it's. It, it, it should be obvious, but it always isn't, particularly with club trailers. So, so really, really triple check them. The best example I've had of uh, people not being ready <laughs> is a couple of them found the trailer and threw it on their car and drove out, opened the trailer, and there was already a glider in it. So, yes, when you've driven 100 <laughs> kilometres... <laughs> to pick up the club discus and you open the trailer and the other club discus is inside it. <laughs> but the, the worst thing is losing, you know, I've, we went to a camp and we forgot like the tailplane. I, I think we, uh, I ferry towed a glider, a DG thousand to Raywood and someone else bought the tailor trailer up. And when we were de-rigging to take it home, there was no tailplane. 
holder in the trailer still in the workshop so easy to miss something and then that's enormously you'd be surprised what span those trailers those you think oh we'll just go in someone's car on that way and it's too long and then eventually you mess around and get loads of foam and kind of wedge it in the trailer but yeah checking the fittings is really really important um because it just makes life so much harder i mean you can have to go back um tire condition fuel if you are leaving your car to be used to pick up you know someone's going to drive your car to pick up the, the glider make sure it's, it's full of fuel and we, we've got insurance there i'm going to switch to one of my one of the tr retrieves i did so i will it's sort of worth it so we'll um share screen yeah you just scroll back up the member of mgc landed out in his sorry yeah, back landed out in his label um he hadn't prepped well for this flight to be honest and hadn't really looked at the weather and i think an outlanding was inevitable with with the, the weather he was flying in it was easterly winds which is always bad at bacchus marsh and with very weak thermals so forced landing was another lecture but he did a rushed forced landing into long grass he like bent the gear sideways you can't see that in the photo so that was already a bad day because he damaged his glider then um, myself and Steve Coulton went to collect him um, and driving back the trailer drawbar started the car went all the trailer went all funny and the drawbar had like bent and broken due to rust um, so have a look at how rusty the trailer is um, there's Steve Coulton smashing it all off with a sledgehammer we eventually took the whole drawbar off. I don't know if you can see this right-hand picture, but we lashed it up with some rope and then um, drove it back. But but a, a simple, what should have been a simple retrieve suddenly went, you know, because he outlanded in daylight and I think we got home about, about um, 11 o'clock because we had to go get tools and rope and everything else and then drive back to fix a trailer to get it home. So do have a look at a lot of glider trailers can be very, very looking a bit rusty, but learn from this one, watch the drawbar. Cause like all these things, it could have been a lot worse. We, we got yeah. away with it. Um, well, there was a couple of guys coming back from the uh, nationals at uh, Narromine uh, earlier this year, and they were driving through Forbes and, they they stopped and uh, one of them looked at Jinxie's trailer and said, "What's that hanging down in the middle?" And they went and had a look, and the whole floor of the trailer had failed, <laughs> and the glider was just sagging through the middle. <laughs> so you know these are experienced guys, but of course you know how old are our trailers now? You know mine's forty eight years old. Yeah, yeah, same here. Mine's probably yeah, certainly thirty years old. So they do uh, do have a look at the trailer. It's basically probably the most neglected thing in gliding, um, but it's. Uh, I've had numerous incidents with trailers, too many to mention, <laughs> but um, it, it, you can get away with it like this, or you could have had a serious road accident, um, and it's really luck of the draw if the trailer starts to break up structurally. Um, we've had trailers where. People don't understand the brake, so they've towed them with the brake on, and then the wheels sort of caught fire. Um, we've had trailers where the brake's just not working properly and binding, and the wheels caught fire. So um, trailers are something to to prepare, and and definitely make sure you understand the, the braking system. There's most of them are pretty normal, but you get some of these cobras and things that are different. And it's if you don't know what you're doing, you can you can drive it off with the brake on and with these big powerful four wheel drives. You don't kind of notice. Um, so we'll go back to the lecture. They really, um, yeah, 
pay attention to the trailer it can spoil your day yes as gary brasher just reminded me in chat um sometimes it's handy to have a power hacksaw blade so you can cut your main pin in half <laughs> yes it's um <laughs> the, the jantar landed so heavily that it did that and uh notch the uh the main pin the only way we could get it out was to cut it fortunately the farmer had a power hacksaw blade you're supposed to have in victoria at least you're supposed to have that trailer leaflet that that vic roads produce but i'm sure you could these days if you just download it on your phone you can show it to the police if they stopped you hmm. so that's trailers Flight preparation checklist. To hat sunscreen, hydration. Yeah, I, I always have outlanding water as well as flight water. So I'll have a separate bottle in the back, just one of those little, um, you know, plastic things you buy in a shop. What's it called? I can't remember. But that, with that, what, you know, have one of those or at least a bike thing, bike size water bottle for outlanding. Nutrition, yeah, it's more about having a packed lunch to eat before you go rather than thinking you've got to eat a packed lunch in flight. I don't know, Jenny, do you, um, do you, do, I mean, I just take an apple sometimes, uh, just some fruit. Do you, do you take anything? You do some pretty long flights. That's Jenny Goldsmith. Come on in. snuck off does, does anyone else take you know give ideas of different foods you might eat on a flight mm. yeah there you go <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah hi paul hi, um yes I, I i really do um like to have something to eat in the cockpit um also because your brain needs a bit of glucose and i like to have something before i land and that usually takes the form of a paleo bar actually from Aldi um, something like that without a lot of well too much added sugar it's full of full of dates so um, it, it has that uh, but no no uh, refined sugar um, and I like I do like to take a sandwich with me <laughs> I enjoy right. that. Well, well, yeah, I think it's nice to have some. Uh, yeah. I've heard people take grapes because it gives some moisture. I take an apple yes. or even two apples because it gives moisture. Um, so, yes. but what I'm saying is you don't need like a, a huge gourmet lunch. You just no. need something. Yeah, sugar. Look, I used to do one of my friends used to fly English electric lightnings that shows my age. And he always had. Um, which is a, for those who don't know, it's a, like a very fast fifties jet <laughs> with a with a landing speed of about two hundred knots or something. And he always had jelly sweets to eat when he was contemplating landing the thing, because he said you just needed to be on your game and a bit of a sugar hit became his ritual uh, for not writing one off. So, so that is something to think about if you're outlanding or something. Maybe you do have a quick sugar hit. Um, well, I, I agree with that. Um, um, at nationals, I'd fly with um, bananas and apples during the task because it wouldn't give you a spike in energy. It would be sort of plateau and, and yes. going for a while. But um, then I had a bag of snakes um, for final glide, and that would give you a real spike so that when you wanted all that energy for that last half an hour, 45 minutes, um, snakes were great. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, I, think, I mean, have a have both, and you've got the options. You've got maybe a sugar hit. And I went to Ziggy, a doctor, I think it's Ziggy whose name, um, used to say, yeah, just what you said, something that doesn't give you a sugar hit that's a bit more slow burning is better because you have a high and a low with sugar, um, which is bananas, apples, things like that and um but but where the low doesn't matter because you're going to land very soon you can you can afford a sugar hit weather forecast um yeah we'll 
most most of us there's a separate briefing on weather but m most people are using sky site or or um xc skies or one of those that gives you a really good forecast three days out you know not a bad one five days out so um, but on the day you should at least go to the bomb and see I always find sky site is great, but the bomb gives you where the cold fronts are and you can lend explains what sky site is telling you. Um, and these forecasts, while they're very accurate, they're still not always accurate and you can still get heaps of sync or something. But it's useful to know, well, I've got a little slide on that. Flight planning tasks, maps, charge mobile phone, um SAR arrangements. I'm going to flick to my other um my other Prezo in a second. Um you do have to have a SAR time in our club, I don't know other clubs or a comp or a horse and coaching, whatever, you have to you, there's a SAR time set or you set your own SAR time. You need to tell your retrieve person what your SAR time is. Um, and then if you get overdue, they follow the, the procedure where you're sort of overdue and then it goes into a rescue mode. So make, make sure you've declared that somewhere. The other thing, um, we in our club, we have a cross-country book, but you must tell someone where you are planning to go. If Because if something does happen and we don't, you know, if you've gone east, north, south or west, you've just made it a hundred times harder to be located and and we don't want to waste police time and all of that so um the, the best thing to do is to, to at least put down what your flight plan was i mean we're getting out of preparation here but i guess doing your sar time is important having an elt you you have to have it in sparsely populated areas so there's some areas around mount beauty um deserty areas where you must have an elt um many of us many of us have one anyway <laughs> and the, the advice we always give in our club is if you've gone way past your SAR time and it's getting dark and you can't you can't find a farmer or get a message and you're just alone in a field just trigger the ELT everyone would rather know that you're okay and yes it will cause AMSA to go into um their process but they'll, they'll probably only send a police car if you're somewhere near a town to go to where the location is and you'll get you'll get picked up don't what we're saying is don't be frightened to use the elt because you know we don't want everyone worrying all night when you're perfectly okay you just couldn't find something you decided to sleep by the glider or something um so don't be frightened to use it uh if you're doing a badge flight, definitely it's all online now, flight declarations and things. But make sure, again, you can't do it on the, if you haven't done one, put one in the week before. <laughs> Start chucking them in and make sure you know how to use the website um, and, and your logger so that um, you're not trying to do something for the first time on the day that you're trying to fly. I always, you know, the more you can do the week before, the better. So that's a week before thing. Um, cars and trailer keys are not with you. Car insurance, full tank, retrieve, crew available. Electrics, rigging, so we've gone through those. Um, I'm just going to go through some more the things I think you should be doing. Stop, share, start, share. Back to my again this is week before stuff or day before uh let's put that to full screen jump around a bit here i've done done trailers um it's you're supposed to read no tams right it's it's the law notices notices for air missions um, that's what it stands for. Um, I've, for those that don't know, just it's called NAPES. Well, I can't remember what that stands for. National Aviation, something or other. But NAPES Login Air Services Australia. If you just Google Air Services or Air Services NAPES, it comes up. 
so if you haven't got a, an account it's free but it doesn't come instantly so you have to put in your details and hit send and then a day or two later they send you a password i don't know if it's got any better but it, it used to be annoying that it didn't do it instantly so so get get your napes login what what's a notice to air mission it tells you a whole load of non-useful stuff but every so often there's something useful in there um um so this is once you've got a login and you log in this is what kind of comes up right so you should be again every time you fly not just cross country normally the instructors are doing it for you um if you so not everyone does it but at gpc level you're supposed to be doing this so you go for area briefing as the option now i'm in um out of Bacchus so area 30 covers most of the cross countries or everything I'll ever do so you just click area you just click in area 30 and it comes up with that number met no time all that and then for the period of 24 hours um, now air services website's got all sorts they're all in funny codes um, and they've all sorts of ways of advice on how to read them within air services website but look, here's one. I just put this in before the lecture. And what through all the gobbledygook, you, you see, um, let's move that more to the middle. There's something that would be useful to know if you're going on a cross country. Um, Banala, grass runway, closed, closed. From 8th of, that's 08 August 17th, 328 to September the 24th, 700 or something. So that's, that's, what what you don't want to do is go on a cross country and d decide, ah, oh, you know, I, I think I'll land at Donald. And there's a NOTAM that was put out by air services saying Donald's closed. And then you land there for whatever reason it's closed and they go, well, what the hell are you landing here for? Um, it was NOTAM that it was closed. So th this is written in a bit of, pigeon english but but for most of it i can just read them and get enough information for what i need for gliding there's all stuff on instrument approaches and you think oh i wonder what all that means but i'm not going into melbourne so um that's you can do and you can do this the night before or you can put 48 hours in and do it two nights before but i would recommend reading no tams for the area that you're going to fly in um and by doing Area 30, it just lists all the airfields. And, and I can scroll through them and, and spot, oh, Banala, that's interesting. You know, Ballarat, load of stuff about training planes, not interested, doesn't affect me. I can, you know, I can land there. I'm just trying to say, is the airfield open or is it closed? Um, next, next bit of pre-flight prep. In that checklist, it said radio frequencies. Um, Again, I've just stepped through for people who haven't done it before. Go to Air Services Australia website and, and select resources, the one with the red circle. Um, that takes you to this list. Uh, you, it comes up with a big disclaimer and you have to hit agree and submit and everything. Because you, when you go into this, it looks like you think, oh, no, this isn't going to be free. It's going to need a login. It doesn't. Just scroll through and go, I agree. And then it jumps to this screen. Um, I'm sure many of you <laughs> on here already know this stuff. But but here is everything um, that you need for gliding. So if you, you know, if you didn't have a current chart, you can download a chart you can screenshot it you can print it on your color printer and laminate it for the area you're going to fly in and then you've got a perfectly legal current air services australia chart um i tend to obviously most of us will, will buy a chart or have os runways um i still think paper charts for flight planning are still i think the best um again it, we're not immune from all the rules of, of of airspace and airfields and CASA. So URSA, En Route Supplement Australia, gives you, I'll go to the next page. So you select the most useful thing is you probably got maps. So you select URSA. Then it comes up with all the different airfields for those that 
I've never used it. I can't remember what RDS is, but we usually use FAC. And you click FAC, and then just as I'm showing here, I've got the one for Ararat. Oh, come back, Ararat. Where are you? Um, and it gives me the information I'm supposed to know as a pilot if I'm going to land at Ararat. So from a gliding point of view, it's got the elevation. That's normally on the map as well. It's got the frequency. And it might have some useful information, um, like there's winch launching. Um, so again, it is we are duty bound to. Um, so again, if I'm going to Horsham, well, if I'm going to Horsham Coaching Week or something like that, or or I'm flying to Ararat, I'll always the diet or a few nights before print out the Ursa for Ararat stall. Ballarat, etc., and it's a bit like school. But the mere fact you printed them and had a read and highlighted what you need to know, it's generally in your mind then. And then if you are landing at Ararat, you, you don't even need to look at the Ursa because you read it two days ago and think, "Yeah, I've got Ararat." Um, but have just you can buy a complete book that's far too big for a glider. So I just print off the ones that I need. Um, and if you want to be, many of us will put all the frequencies down on a little card so that we can, that's even quicker to read. These are not very able, easy to read in flight when everything's bouncing around and you're getting low. So if you are going to read directly off them, highlight it with a highlighter pen because you'll never find a frequency um, <laughs> when you're beginning to get stressed and low. But, but, but we're, we're, there's sort of, everything's, online and free now so it's sort of no excuse not to be reading this stuff to go land at an airfield and not having read ursa um could and not having read no tams you, you're beginning to when i does everyone understand that the swiss cheese i talk about factors lining up towards an accident um it, there might be information in ursa and information in in no times that had you known you wouldn't have landed on during a drag race or something and and um caused a diplomatic event if not something worse so i do encourage people to print the urses out they don't change very often so you can print them out now and they'll be good for for the whole season at the airfields we go to all right melbourne might change very often but our kind of airfields don't change much any more in flight planning um so yeah no tams you have to read those 24s before ursa gives you airfield information for all the places you might want to land um and if you haven't got a current chart you can print off you can bring up a chart and you can um snip it and print it for the section you're going to use Else I got in here. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's soaring computers. Go back to the GPC. So you're halfway through your uh, time now, Paul. All right. Oh, the, the one I didn't do was whether. Um, for those that have looked at Sky Sight, uh, Friday is looking like a really good day. So start prepping. Um, I think that's actually it for this one. Does anyone want to add any more interesting um, flight preparation? stories or information all right i better just try and summarize so it's prepare yourself prepare the glider um do your do your flight planning which is no, the stuff you can do the day before no tams and um get ursa 
for any airfields you might fly over. Um, probably the, the, the bit that stresses me most with flight planning is actually the flight computers. <laughs> so I'm, I, I definitely encourage having those pre-programmed even if you don't know what route you're going to fly, practice with it the night before and make sure the waypoints are in. And um, it's it's on a screen that you recognize, so to speak. Um, you have less of a chance with the, the stuff in the glider. You can only do that on the day. But you could practice it the day before or two days before. Um, but they are highly complex pieces of kit. Okay, let me go to the next shop share. Roll to the first slide. So what's what's the plus of 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 flight computers? Um they they really they give you information um that's that you can't get from just the old old round dials. And you configure them to suit you and your and and the, and the way you fly. So, yeah, advanced variometers. Mo most well, I can see a picture here. The S one hundred. So we have in our gliders have got got both the vario and the moving map and everything all on one one round dial. Um, I would I would still recommend because of the the complexity of setting these things up you're much better off with a handheld flight computer like an UDI or a nano or xc saw on a phone um, that you can practice with at home and, and set up how, how you want to set them up um, they they very they're very variable in 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 what they show so uh, and this preso doesn't doesn't go much much into them but let's let's well let's go through it so advanced variometers um averaging of the in instantaneous vertical climb rate so they give you a an, an an average of your climb rate rather than just looking at it bleeping at you know, six or seven knots, you get what you're re what really is going on real time. Um, you can switch Neto. So N Neto Vario gives you, um, it, it, sub it subtracts the glider sync rate from everything. So you see what the air is doing much more clearly. And w when you use it, when you use a Neto Vario, it's generally on final glides or long glides, where if you're going along at 100 knots and you're already going at sort of six knots down or five knots down, just because that's what the glider does at 100 knots or 90 knots, it's very hard to see if you're in rising or falling air. Um, whereas if you switch to Neto, it will... It will it will subtract the six knots that's there all the time and just show you what's going on. But then if you stay in Neto when you go into thermaling, it's utterly confusing and doesn't work at all. So you have to switch back. So most of the, obviously the round dial instruments can't do that, the, the old fashioned vacuum barrios, um, but these can. So know how to switch it to Neto and just have a, have a play with it. The other thing you do when you 
when you play back your um with with most of these you've got simulators so you can play back your flight on a simulator of the instrument on your computer and you can actually switch it from man um, netto to um normal vario if you like on your computer and see what the vario would have read if you'd had it in netto and it's quite that is quite a useful thing to do um they these these instruments are give you um some really um um total energy so they're trying to damp out wind gusts and things like that so they are much um much better at indicating real lift versus gusts and you can you can see that on on the ground with these where if it's parked in the wind you'll see the mechanical vario sort of flicking away with the gusts and this is sort of rock steady um the s100 does have speed to fly information so theory and it's not just theory is um what's happening to my internet if just 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 to give you an example again it's great with a flight computer if if you've got if you set when you set a, a task in a flight computer it 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 gives you the height required to complete the task. So it might be a 200 kilometer, say you're going to fly a 200 kilometer task. It effectively says, well, if you took a tow to 20,000 feet, you'd be able to complete this task. And so it's telling you that to do this task, you need 20,000 feet. So that on a good day, that could be, okay, so that's four climbs of 5,000 feet. If I can do this task in four climbs. Um, but the height you need, the, 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 have a think about it. So if I put my flight computer in and I've got McCready set to zero and I put my task in at 300Ks and it typically will say you need 20,000 feet or it will show that you are your arrival height is minus 20,000 feet. It will give some, some, they give you somewhere, they'll give you that information. If you wind the McCready up to six knots, it now thinks, okay, the six knot speed to fly, McCready is speed to say 100 knots. So now I'm going to be descending a lot quicker while I'm flying. So to fly that same, we said 200 kilometer task needing 20,000 feet. When you wind the McCready up, you'll see that the amount of height you need goes up. So you'll now see it's 40,000 feet to complete the task. So get get that in your mind. The, the, the higher your McCready setting, the, the idea is you fly the McCready um, speed. Um, so for six knot McCready, your flight manual through the drag polar will tell you what speed to fly um for that and the, the higher the mccready the more height you're going to need therefore um the and but it's, it's expecting you to fly at that speed it's no good setting mccready at six and then just flying at 55 knots the computer will uh compute all sorts of odd odd things so you need to um understand the higher the McCready the more height you need so McCready theory just not to get too much into it is but if it's a really good day and you're going to be climbing at um, a thousand feet a minute it, it's much better to fly faster because your climbs are going to be very quick and you'll actually get around the task quicker than someone just cruising at best LD at 55 knots because um, they'll take a lot longer um, but then when you have McCready, when it's a two knot day, the reverse is true. You want to fly slower and preserve height. Um, 
because you're climbing much slower. So McCready is saying, giving you for the conditions, it's giving you the speed to fly. So these computers will do all that for you and give you um, a speed to fly. But it, it will only vary with your McCready setting. Some of them are, I haven't managed to work out how to do it on the S100 yet because it's always in a glider and I never get enough time. But the S100 just gives you a very fixed McCready um, because it, it, things can vary during the day and the speed to fly into wind is different to the speed to fly downwind for the optimum flight path. And the S100 that we've got in our gliders are set. They just give you a fixed speed, whether you're into wind or downwind. So you think, okay, well, I could just read that off a chart. It's not doing much computing. Um, so, so do understand, how to, one, how to set the McCready setting, two, what it means, which is another lecture. And But do observe as you wind up the McCready, you, which is your best guess of what the thermal strength is going to be, and you can change it in flight. It will give you speed to fly. I've got some pictures later. Um, here's probably the most common. Well, I'd say XC saw. These are like $1,000 and XC saw is free and on your phone. Uh, I'd say the only minus of XC saw is your phone battery. Uh, uh, can, you know, you often need it to supplement the power in the phone to make it last because it's doing a lot of computing and you want it on bright screen because it's sunny. You don't want it flicking off into, you know, standby mode. You want it on for the whole flight. So you'll find it does chew up battery and you do need a booster battery and cable. Um, but what does, what does the, the, the uh, I'm not going to get into how to program them because they are, one, there's a million YouTube clips. Two, there's, um, a million options um, on what data you want to display. And the more advanced you are, the more interested information you get. But I'll show you some pictures in a minute of some of mine and how I have them set up. Um, this one here is saying a McCready setting, I think there's two and a half knots. If you fly the McCready speed, you're 3,600 and you need 3,600 feet to fly it at the McCready speed. And you need 2,700 feet to fly it at best LD. Um, but you'll take a lot longer. And all, all gliding is all about speed in the end. You're always racing against yourself. And and that, that time from when lift starts to when lift stops. So... I mean, this this slide this this lecture is just three slides, um, I think. But I'll put some pictures up in a minute, and then we'll get some some knowledge from some of the um, more experienced people here on how this can improve your performance. But for the basics, I'll show you how I have mine set up with useful information. Um, so how, XESAW and UD essentially do the same thing. So there's no um, um, real difference between the information that they'll display and their computing power. Um, so what do they give you? Yes, a moving map is really useful. Um, you, you, you program your task in, which is really um, useful as well. Um, they show airspace. That's useful, but in part of your pre-flight prep because it's so zoomed in and you look at this green line here it doesn't really the airspace is changing but about by what to what um so i would definitely i always look at the airspace that i'm going to fly in and have a mental picture of it and for our 300k flights it's never complicated there might be two airspace steps so if i'm going out from um Bacchus Marsh, I know I have to go past Viskville, then I can go to eight and a half thousand feet. And then once I get past Ballarat, Ballarat I can go to 12,000 feet. I would I would check that on the map before I went, but that's my memory of it. But do I do that just before I go and I'm approaching Viskville? I know that green line, and this must be the step between four and a half and eight and a half. Um, so by having that little mental model, you can 
it makes the flight computers more useful. So I'd definitely say for airspace, they are great. They bleep away at you when you're approaching airspace. So they do do that. They do warn you something's happening. Um, but you do need that mental model as to what as to the bigger picture because the zoomed in screen is just too much. So do in your pre-flight brief the day before or look at the map. Um, you can look at the online map or uh, and get the big picture of where you're flying in. They show terrain. I don't, I don't find that. You know, we're we're kind of flying in flatland glider country in the main, and I don't find terrains particularly useful um, on these things. Just in, you know, it's more interesting. Oh, there's a lake. Oh yeah, there's the lake on the ground. The, the things working type of thing. Um, final glide. Yes, as I said, based on selected MacReady. So um, the higher the MacReady setting, um, the more height you need for your final glide. Um, um, but that's that's a good thing. Um, many options for information. Yes, tons of options. The, the final glide's comforting, but it's not... It, you can go from having final glide to not having, you can just sit on a final glide and one minute you've got final glide and then you haven't got final glide because you've hit a load of sync. So the computer doesn't know what's going to happen. Um, the, the, I learned at Horsham this last coaching week, um, hearing some of the people that, you know, have, uh, in the competitions, everything everything really matters. I'm not really a competitive pilot, but everything really matters. So they're much very attuned to final glides, and because it wins or loses you points, big time. But the the longer your final glide, the more accurate this this is going to be, because the the sink and the lift on your final glide starts to average out. And so when it says you've got final glide 50 kilometers out, 60 kilometers out, you probably have, and you might go a bit below it, but you carry on and then you'll, you'll end up back on it and then you're a bit above it. And then you're in sync and a bit below it. And on average, um, you, you're going to make it. If you're doing, you know, if your last turn point is only 10 kilometers from the airfield and, and you stabilize or, and you're into wind, um, these are probably there's a good chance that that if you're just doing a, a like a minimal final glide right i've got it says i need um it says i've got a final glide i'm at three thousand feet i've got 20 kilometers to go i should make it um over those short distances into wind especially you might not make it so use the good old mark one eyeball as well and just look at the airfield that you're going to and go what does the angle look like um be conscious of of um final glides and it, look it doesn't matter i'm okay i've got to take another thermal i'll make some turns in some lift um i tend to be conservative with my final glides because I'm, I'm you know on a good day and it's not competing so i think oh I'll go above. The biggest trap with these computers, I think we'll get onto some of them, is you can set a safety height. But if you don't know if you set it or not, you don't know. You can have a final glide that says you'll arrive at zero feet. What you're looking at the screen here and it says minus three and minus two. Now, um, if I've got a safety height of a thousand feet in there, I need to know that because it's saying, if I climb another 2,000 uh, or another 4,000 feet, I'll have final glide. And that is that bringing you into the airfield at circuit height or is it bringing you in at zero feet? And it's really easy to, if you set it some months ago and then you're flying along and you think, you start to doubt, you think this doesn't look right. Did I set the safety height or is the safety height zero? So you know what you've set. And, and always keep it the same, I suggest. So if you, some people just have it set zero and then they know they want to be a thousand foot above final glide to arrive at circuit height. And some people have it set at a thousand feet. And so when they look at their final glide, they know they're going to arrive at a thousand feet. So 
He takes your money and takes your choice. So critical things. All of the the these devices have they, they like to, they don't want to know what glider you're flying because they've got the drag polar um programmed in, which is the thing that says what speed to fly for what thermal strength. Um as well as then will it, you know, it knows this glider will do 10 kilometers per thousand feet. This one will do 15 kilometers per thousand feet. It's getting all that information for final glide predictions, et cetera, et cetera, from the drag polar. Um, um, what else is in here? Do, 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 do. The other thing, certainly um, S100 and I'm sure I'm sure XC saw does, although I was looking for it the other day and couldn't find it. You normally have to put the glider weight in. It's because it needs to know if you've got what your weight is as to um because all gliders with water have got two drag polars and it will switch between them depending on the weight. So if you need to put the glider weight in so it knows the wing loading or the wing loading in, it will have a, a box for that. Um that's pretty important they've got other factors you can put bug factors and things like that if you want to but i would tend to just go with our level anyway just go with the, the getting the glider weight correct and the polar correct um just looking at this if you're doing well it's best to put your name in as well so often it's best to have your own name in the logger and the glider rego. So when you download the flight and put it onto WeGlide, it's all correct. Um, and if you do a badge or something, that's critical because it's got someone else's name in it. Guess what? <laughs> the observer will go, <laughs> sorry, but the evidence doesn't, it's not going to stand up when it's got someone else's name in there. So make sure you do that. All this can be done weeks before the flight. Um, airspace you upload but look the number of warnings you get never it, it's very easy to say configure and learn the warnings um, the only way you'll learn it is by hooking your computer up to condor or something which you can do with XC saw and flying a condor flight and and, and using your flight computer in the sim mode um, the S100 constantly bleeps different bleeps and I I have to say I don't know what they all are but I know the airspace ones because I have a picture of the airspace and go yeah that's the airspace warning um so put your airspace maps in so wind strength and direction is normally just a display option um some are just using when you when you thermal and you drift downwind in a thermal, it uses that those those thermals to um, that drifting to calculate the wind strength. Uh, some now are using inertial mix with everything uh, these, these hawk or anime that give you even more accurate real time wind by comparing accelerometers with with air data. But um, useful to have wind strength and direction. So that's a pre-flight setting. That's a pre-flight setting. Airspace boundaries is a pre-flight setting. Um, uh, required an actual track. Entering the task is normally not too difficult. I would say in the early days, pick a, we are very often there's start points. Um, I'll show you in some pictures in a minute of how not to do it. But if you don't fly through the start, the thing won't trigger to the next waypoint automatically. Um, and if you want to ignore a start, which I find, you know, when you're just casually um, flying, you, sometimes you programmed in this nice task with a nice start line and the tugs towed you somewhere else and you hit a great thermal and you think, I can't be bothered flying back to my start. I just want to go off on track. Um, so know how to to 
um, switch your computer to ignore the start and just start flying the task. Um, it's possible to do it with UD and it's possible to do it with LX Nav. I'm sure it is with XCSaw as well. Um, or put a start point that's on your track. So it, it's five kilometers. If you're going west, it's all, the start point's five kilometers west of the airfield. Then you can't fail to go through it. Um, no, you can put multiple start points in XCSaw. Yeah. So it's worth having um, a start point that that you plan to fly through and not just say, oh, I'll make the start point straight over the airfield and you get towed five kilometers west and you hit a great thermal or even worse, it's really weak lift and you just want to press on. You don't want to go back. Um, so, so think about your start point. Know how to change your McCready doesn't stay the same for the whole flight. So the McCready setting is your your best bet for the next thermal. Um, by setting the McCready, it it gives you speed to fly between thermals, and that optimizes the time you'll take to go on the task. The other thing is when when SkySight says it's you know a six a six knot day. The McCready setting is is what you will achieve in your your time to center the thermal, your your possibly you know losing it or getting losing it higher up and coming back into it, and if you if you spend a turn at the top thinking surely it's going to go higher, um, all those things make it different to what SkySight says or the weather forecast. So I'll be honest, if it's a six knot day, I'd probably be setting a three or four knot McCready because I know I'll never achieve. I might get about half the rate that's published. Um, that's just me. I need to practice more. Um, so, so yeah, don't be over ambitious. Put what you think you can achieve. Now, the, the, the modern Vario that we looked at area will give you the average. So the average you're achieving on the Vario, the averager, is what goes in McCready. Not the, doo -doo -doo -doo, wow, I got six knots. What what did you average in that thermal? It's a lot lower. So think about that. Um, know how to change McCready. Um, airspace boundaries. Display required track and actual track. Yes, distance and bearing to turn point, finish height. Safety altitude, we talked about that. Simulators, most can be run in simulator, simulator mode on the device. Also PC simulator versions. For, um, certainly for S, uh, LX nav stuff, being able to replay your flight trace back on the computer is hugely beneficial um, in learning how to use the computer. So do take LX Nav. It's quite simple because you can just bring up you can bring up the flight computer on your computer screen, you know, a simulation of it with all the buttons and everything. You can put your trace into it, and you can replay the flight on the computer, and you can change McCready settings and this, that, and the other, and see what it what the how the instruments change. Um, know how to use them for safety. Um, flight computers will distract you from other tasks. Definitely, you, you, you need, yes, you can't, you need to be able to fly without the computer because it can go flat or, or you've hit some screen setting and you can't get out of it. Um, you know, for a big task, really, your flight's over if you've got no flight computer, if you're trying to do something really really serious but it doesn't mean you can you can do a couple of hundred k's just by reading the map and looking out you don't need one of these um make sure they're correctly configured yeah look if you don't put your polar in and you don't put the glider weight in um and it, it's going to give inaccurate predictions um understand the limitations of predictions it It doesn't know what's what 
the computer doesn't know whether the wind's going to change or the headwind's going to get stronger or the sink's going to be worse or we just fly badly, um, all those things. So it, it it's not they're not totally predictable. They're not giving you completely accurate predictions of what's going to happen. Um, but they are still pretty good, all right? It's pretty rare that it'll give you um, a final glide that will be way out. Um, as I say, the shorter the distance it's got, particularly into wind, the worse it will be. Um, but a long distance, um, they're reasonably good. But into wind, be more careful and be a bit, you know, have a bit more up your sleeve. Use your map. The best way to use the map is to look at it the day before and have a complete picture of everything which towns you're flying over which lakes the thing the big things that are going to be easy to see that will help you navigate because the worst thing you can do is put the wrong waypoint in and you need to be able to spot that and go well i've just come off tow i'm supposed to be going towards that lake japarat which i can see on the horizon and the computer saying going that way so clearly i've got the wrong task in let's you know you should pick that up very quickly is what direction is my first turn point and am i actually going in that direction when i follow the computer and every so often you will make a mistake and you'll just confuse two names when you put the task in and it's sending you off somewhere else you should really pick that up because you look at the task zoomed out and go yeah what that is what i want to do but um it is occasionally these things Normally through human error, we'll have um, some something um, wrong. I'm going to just switch to my Prezo again. I'll just show you how I've set my computer up, if you like, and, and some of the mistakes I've made and see if you can spot some of them. Um, Um, air services. Da, 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 da. This this is all right. This is a, I prepared for this flight. This isn't a brilliant. It's. I would encourage you to take photos of your screen so you can learn later. So my mistake on this one was I'd forgotten to put. Uh, I'd forgotten to put north up. So you can set them whether you want track up or north up. So I got north up and not track up. So if you have for those again new to the sport, you generally want you want the computer. If you're flying along with a paper map and you're you're flying west, you always hold the map so that you know if, if you're flying from Bacchus towards Melbourne going east, you hold the map so Melbourne is where it's supposed to be relative to you flying. You don't just hold the map with north up and go, I'm going across it. These computers allow you to do both. So here I'm flying um, right to left um, and that direction's north. That, that's, that's not the way to fly. It's much better that the direction you're flying is always up the screen, not across the screen and it keeps shifting. So... They have north up and track up as options. Make sure you have track. Track up is the one that you want. So, you know, it's always interesting. Uh, where's the next one? You know, that one. This is somewhere out near Ararat. Um, this is uh, LX9000, I think. Just showing some. Oh, okay, back. Um, some of so I put this one up just to show about if you look at these circles you can't they, they say they display all sorts of things that you're not expecting and you think so is that airspace is that what is it now um, what what LX seem to do is put range rings around airfields of 10 nautical miles for some reason I mean, you're supposed to make a radio call 10 nautical miles out, um, but it does clutter up the map. Um, so, again, if you've done your pre-flight prep and looked at the map and then it starts showing things, you go, 
well i know there's no i know there's no zone around ararat and this next one must be stall or something so it's showing something on the map that i don't understand but it looks like a 10 nautical mile range ring and probably i can go into settings and switch that off um but but that's that's just a, a lesson from that one. You go to the next one. Here's Udi, which I must say I'm more familiar with. Um, this was a first flight in this glider, and it was the, the settings were set for by someone else because I hadn't actually bought it yet. But let's look again. Some of the useful information on here. So target Raywood. I like to know where I'm what I've got programmed in. Um, distance, 41 kilometers. That's useful information. Um, it's saying I'm supposed to turn right 167 degrees. And my ground speed's 83 knots. I've got a final glide here, uh, whatever McCready. I've got a three knot McCready set. Um, so I've got a marginal final glide, 464 feet positive. I'm just going to go to the next one. Uh, oh, sorry, it's on. Go back. Do, 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 do. This one, this this screen here is my my typical cross country screen. Where I will have. I'm trying to get it. Let's go full screen. Sorry. Maybe I'll move all this over here. So I like to have, there's my McCready button, so I can go plus or minus. So there's McCready setting, I think. There's um, there's my target that I'm flying to. There's I have the nearest airport, so it's telling me um, the nearest airport. Um, if I was getting low, it, you, you could it's telling you the nearest airport and how far away it is. Um, I like ground speed in knots. Um, Distance to um, where I'm going, 111 kilometers. Above ground level, I'm 9,283 feet. So um, pretty pretty good there. Uh, do, 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 do. Required LD um, to get to my target, so 37. Required LD is another way of um, estimating your final glide. If it says you need an LD of 100 to 1, and <laughs> you're not going to make it. Once you get into an LD that's equivalent to what you think, yeah, my glide is a 40 to 1 glider. I need 30, it's saying I only need 37 to 1 to get there. Um, that's good. You can display the actual LD or achieving as well. And when the two match, it means you've got final glide. Um, I haven't got any um, but I, I would encourage everyone set the boxes that you want um, as I say there's probably what's on an UD probably 50, 60, 70 different displays you can have for different um pieces of information and you can set screens up so you can flick between screens um, as well so you can switch to another screen so say for example um, lx tends to have your task screen and then your go home screen so that if you suddenly think you know what i just want to go back home um instead of having to reprogram and go to you just switch to the next screen and that's always already programmed to go home and giving you all the information to get there. Um, let me just talk about that because I think it's, while it's not part of this lecture, it, it, part of part of planning, I don't know how many people have seen this, but this is the GPC simple flight plan. And part of your prep before you go flying is to um, fill this, uh, fill a very simple flight plan out. 
um, and then part of your prep before you go flying on the cross country is to think how, how long can you afford to spend on each leg of the cross country flight because um if 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 you're going along far too slowly you, you can start to think you know what i ought to turn for home and by doing the pre-flight prep you know when to make that decision rather than trying again the more you do on the ground because you only have half a brain in the air the more you do on the ground the more um, easy it is to think oh yeah i said if i hadn't made it past this point in two hours um i better head back so this this is something that, again you I could plan for Friday now. I could do a rough plan based on SkySight, what it says. So know what the wind is. This is um, surface wind, 2,000 foot wind, 5,000 foot wind. You might get more sophisticated and put, if, if there's a big wind change showing, then you might want to put the wind the wind at you know from two till three o'clock is this and then from three till five it's this um the thermal height for the day again get that from sky sight average achieved climb so again if sky sight saying it's a six knot day i'd probably be a three knot person um what sort of cloud is it, you know, is there cumulus around? Max temp. And this is the, the all in, the all important. Um, expected cross country speed is dependent on the thermal strength. And that's another lecture, but with you very quickly with your drag polar, you can draw a line and go, okay, and there's someone, and you only have to do it once, or you can get it from your flight computer, but there's one there for a typical LS4. Um, so if it's a, a two-knot day, your cross-country speed will be 50 kilometers an hour average, right? So that's your, that's the combined time of cruising and climbing. You'll end up at 50 kilometers an hour. If it's a three-knot day at 60, four knots to do that. Um, so that gives you a speed prediction. Your sky sight or any of the other forecasting programs will show you when soaring starts and it will show you when soaring ends. So this day, it's three hours. So I've got three hours at 60 kilometers an hour. I've got a 180 kilometer flight to plan. It's not, not kind of rocket science. But the plus of doing this is um what's that's 60 kilometers say a triangle with 60 kilometer legs well if i take two hours to do the first leg because i hit lots of sink and i get low and i'm scratching around we've all you know we all get those days um it's now like um two o'clock so it's now four o'clock and i'm only at the first turn point guess what in your mind you'll already be thinking I'm not just going to press on to the next. That's inevitably going to lead to an outlanding. I, I better go home. So you have a rough feel for the for, for the day ahead and the performance of the glider and how quickly you expect to get around the legs. And if you're not achieving those speeds, you you can uh, make a decision to return to home. Your your flight computer will give you an estimated time of arrival as well. And if you start to see that go, you know, well past five o'clock, um, it, it, it's 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 it start to make that decision about turning home. So it is well worth, you know, this is GPC lectures, one of them, but just just screenshot that and make a little plan about your flight and how long you expect to be on each leg, what's going to happen to the weather. And again, by writing it down and thinking about it, you probably won't have to actually look at this in flight because you've thought about it and written it down. And you think, yeah, I know it's three hours. Um, I know that the soaring is going to end around five. I know the cloud base. The, the other reality is, isn't it, that it, the sky site says it's 6,000 and it's only like 4,000 um, 
halfway round because it gets obscured by high cloud or something. Um, your your flight computer will will if you like uh, um, adjust for that because it will see that you're you're if you you're having to take more climbs and your cross country speeds dropping and your time of arrival is um is is blowing out so good good to have a thought it through the night before about what might happen and what the day is looking like and then you can update it on the day and then once you've thought it all through you almost can throw this in the bin because it's now in your mind um as to, to what's going to happen um and it helps you understand, you know, why your flight computer is starting to change data. Because you think, that's, you know, I started the flight and it gave my time of arrival of five o'clock. And now I've done the first leg. And you think, oh, yeah, well, we were predicting 6,000 foot and it's only 4,000 foot and it's not as strong. And um, the computer's adjusting and my estimated time of arrivals on task is going way out. Um, the other the other trick um, with flight computers, particularly as you start to plan bigger flights, is to put um, lot lots of waypoints in. More, you know, so there's a three hundred k triangle and a five hundred k triangle almost, and you can you you can you can always go to next. You see, so. If you just put three waypoints in, going to next jumps you, you know, you've gone from going north to going west. But if you say, I, I'll put a waypoint at 100 kilometers, and I'll put a waypoint on the same heading at 150, and another one at, at 200, and then my next one is my westerly one, if I was going north, that's the next leg of my triangle. Um, and I might put one... 100 kilometers west and 120 kilometers west say and then i've got my go home one you can always if the day's looking good you go you know you, you reach your first 100 k's and you think this is brilliant and and it will automatically flick to the next waypoint and you carry on on that very long leg but if it, the day is rubbish you can just say go to next go to next and it will eventually it will jump to the one you want to go to the um the one that's due west and skip those extra long ones it's just a way of saving trying to reprogram the thing in flight um you can you can, it's very easy to skip to the next waypoint with these flight computers so if you're not sure what kind of day it is um you, you can put a single leg with 100 k's 150 and 200 k's then your next point say to the west and then your next point and at the 100 k point if you think I just want to go to my next proper waypoint, my next westerly one, if you, if you understand what I'm all saying, you say next, next, and you're now heading west. Um, but it, it's a way of being flexible in flight without having to sit and try and put new waypoints in or a new task in because the day is rubbish and you want to do a shorter task. So plan the long one, but put some breakout points in it, if you like. So if it's not going well, you, you just skip till you get to the the next waypoint that's taking you home or uh, taking you on a shorter triangle. I don't know. Do you ever do that, Dave? Um, Dave, do you ever do that kind of trick and put lots of waypoints on the same leg so that you can, if it's going well, you fly the complete leg, and if it's going badly, you just skip two per waypoints. And not sure if Dave's there. So, any um, questions on flight computers, or anyone here that that wants to explain a little bit more about them in the competition world? Okay. If there's no questions, we'll we'll call it call it today. Um, but um, thanks thanks for uh, listening, everyone, and we'll hope hope you got something out of that.
Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I certainly did get stuff out of that. Oh, good. <laughs> it explains some things to about my computer that I didn't know. So good. Thank you. Yes, look, they they are they are a mystery sometimes as to what's how they're calculating things. Uh, I still, be honest, I still don't know if they. If I'm going downwind on my first leg, is it is it predicting my final or height required or whatever or task time, knowing that my next leg's going to be back into wind? Or does it wait till I go into wind and the ground speed slows right down and then it gives a new prediction? I'm pretty sure they probably try to account for the wind for the whole route. But, um, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they do. Because yeah. um, they, they do seem um, pretty accurate. But... but they're certainly much yes. better than probably days when you had to do it all by um, slide rule type things. So we'll call it mm -hmm. a day there then. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank Both you, Paul. All right. Cheers. Bye. Good luck. Cool. Bye.